to happen. Uh, we're investing in our teachers as we speak with reading academies and, and the resources to, to teach literacy. Um, House Bill 3 created um, uh, funding incentives to support um, extending the school year um, uh, to, to, uh, for, for students who need it. So there's a lot of good bones for us to build from. And of course, our, you know, our education leaders around the state have been driving continuous improvement for kids for years. Uh, we just have to do more faster. So um, our kids require us to be the best versions of ourselves for them. Uh, and uh, coronavirus uh, certainly makes that even more so true. So um, I don't know, Liz, if you want to kind of just open it up to uh, general questions, but I mean, that's kind of the backdrop of the, uh, of the, of the challenge we see writ large. Right, it's a big challenge. Um, I'm wondering regarding this legislative session, what are the top things you'd like to see this happen this session for education? Um, well, I mean, it, so first and foremost is preserve the gains that were made by House Bill 3. Um, and I believe that's basically been done. The introduced budgets in both chambers fully fund uh, public education, fully fund the foundation school program, embeds all the funding components of House Bill 3. Um, uh, and from a resource perspective, and then the question is how, many, how, how much additional resources can we provide to our school systems? Um, given the huge amount of sort of remediation acceleration that is going to have to take place. So House Bill 3 plus. Uh, and um, uh, there are federal resources that have been made available to the state that I think will make that possible. But, um, you know, there's a lot of decisions that have to be made in the state. Um, you know, we're in a state we can't print money in Texas. So you got to balance the balance the books at the end of the day. Um, I think uh, beyond the sort of uh, appropriations related questions, there are um, this big question of how is remote instruction going to be supported um, on a permanent basis. So we've set up, uh, we've used emergency rulemaking to set up, set up a one-year framework to fully fund remote instruction uh, alongside in-person instruction. But our, you know, our rules, um, much like Cinderella's carriage, turn into a pumpkin at the end of the school year. So um, what, the, what is going to be the sort of more permanent posture of the state for remote instruction is a big question. And then again, what uh, aspects of the either policy or appropriations can support uh, acceleration, can encourage as many districts as possible to be bold in the actions that they take to support, um, uh, you know, increased learning from students. And, you know, we, we uh, uh, you know, sometimes people hear me and they, they, you know, hear me talk about academics and they think that that's, that's all that I mean when I'm talking about education, but it's not. We've got, kids have to be um, sort of ready to learn. So you think about a lot of the mental crises that folks have been facing throughout this um, pandemic. People are losing loved ones. You know, we're, our entire social behaviors uh, have changed in a year. We're all cooped up. So we've, we've got to make sure that we uh, are sensitive to that and that um, uh, we support the efforts that, that school districts do to, to um, educate every aspect of the child, mind, mind body, and soul. I'll unmute. Okay. Yeah, that's a, we'll see how much time is left. And I know they now have different priorities after the winter storm we just had. Do you know uh, what kind of traction we're getting with high school students with selecting and remaining on the STEM endorsement track? I have no idea. I don't, I don't, um, okay. I, I don't know. We, we would theoretically have that data from last year's graduation. Uh, graduates, I haven't, I haven't seen that. And I don't know what kind of course selection changes have occurred. We do know that there's been a massive dip, especially for low income kids in first time college enrollment. Um, so we think about kids coming out of those pathways. Um, uh, and I don't know how long that uh, change will, will reverberate, but that'll have uh, pretty extraordinary consequences for our state long term. There's a there's a study out of uh, uh, that the TEA did actually before I arrived from kids that came to Texas post Katrina, and what the study showed is that the um, as the kids were sort of uh, uh, subjected to significant supports from the school districts that absorbed them, it took four years and they caught up to state averages in reading. That doesn't mean they accelerate, but they caught up to state averages in reading, and they never caught up in math. Um, there's a there's another study uh, out of Argentina. There was a teacher strike for about 80 days in the in the 1980s. Economists have studied that, and what, when the kids came back to school, there wasn't any like change. It was just okay. Well, we missed 80 days. We'll just pick up and then and keep keep doing. Um, uh, economists have found that those kids suffered from much lower levels of educational attainment. So you think more high school dropouts, lower levels of high school grades. 
uh, fewer levels of college completion. Um, and that it actually had a 20 year GDP impact on Argentina, um, oh, wow. measurable. So um, the, the, you know, the work that we were gonna do for the next four, five, six years really, um, to deal with this uh, educational uh, catastrophe uh, is, uh, is significant and failure is not an option. We can't, we can't just do what Argentina did. We've got to make a lot of changes operationally and change is painful, frankly. Uh, most people like doing their own thing the same way they've always done it. And uh, we're going to have to, we're going to have to get out of our comfort zone. And, you know, that's, that's hard enough when you have like good relationships with people and you're talking about, you know, a team of five and leaders like, Hey, let's all come together. And um, when you're talking about 700,000 people across the entirety of the system of public education, and that's before you get to the students and the parents, um, there's a, you know, there's, there's going to, we're going to have to, we're going to have to push the system forward. Yes. Bill, you had a question that you might want to ask that is kind of goes along with what he's talking about now and the difficulty of getting kids caught up. Do you want to ask your question there? Sure. I mean, um, and I know this is a, <laughs> both a big operational uh, challenge as well as a financial challenge, but shouldn't, uh, should the state extend the school year for all ISDs uh, well into the summer so that kids can be better prepared for the start of the next school year? Uh, so you're asking a question that gets at the heart of a governing philosophy uh, question, which is sort of what decisions should be made at the state level and apply to everyone and what decisions should be made at the local level. Um, uh, and um, we, have a, we have a system that's, um, that's predicated on local control with some guardrails. That's basically the, the way that I think of the public education system in Texas. Um, and the school calendar decisions are inherently a local determination in that system. Um, I do think uh, I do think that's actually probably the right way to do it, uh, to be perfectly honest, because um, you think of conversations that you have to have with your staff and with your parents about those kinds of changes, what's optional, what's not optional, how, how are you going to go through that? There's a lot of community differences in terms of how that you go through that change management process. However, I do think it's very wise for the state to create incentives to encourage school districts to do that as much as possible should it make sense in their local community. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So I have another question here from Kim Kasten um, with RISD. Kim, would you like to ask your question? I would, thank you, Mrs. Morse. Um, Commissioner Murat, before we get started, we live in a world of absence of criticism is the best compliment, but um, on behalf of my colleagues that are on uh, the Zoom today, Thank you for your leadership. Uh, you know, we thank our teachers, we thank our superintendents, our boards, our local folks, but um, there is only one commissioner and this has been uh, unprecedented, which is an incredibly overused word and then following the events of last week, but we appreciate greatly um, the work that you've done. Yeah, certainly um, after last week, I'm just waiting for frogs or locusts. Uh, uh, I, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm predicting a, a grasshopper, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, this, this summer. Um, and, and, I, and I will say up front for myself personally, I do support the STAR test in the spring as um, we, we need data to drive the decisions. And, and I think that that is an important part of what we do. Um, so as we talk about, and I can tell what's on your heart is academic performance, uh, not only making up what we've lost, but looking ahead to accelerating it. So as a, a board member and connection to you as a former board member, what I would say is, we have the need to finish 2020, 2021 strong with confidence. And one of those areas of confidence is the concept of hold harmless, which is providing the funding that was based on the snapshot date in October. And I know there are some concerns in the legislature by particular legislators that if, if school districts are granted hold harmless, that we will abandon our efforts to, um, to very robustly look for our kids, which um, I think you know the heart of superintendents, their staffs and boards, so that's not the case. But I'm fearful that if we have to keep worrying about the funding because you know we have hired people based on that funding, we'll have to dip into fund balance uh, to, uh, to make up the loss. And then of course, we'll, reach in, we'll, we'll look at our funding for 21-22. But, what is the status of hold harmless, especially given last week? I will tell you our deductible is six figures on the 45 out of 55 yep. buildings that were 
impacted. So, so um, uh, I, we're we're real close to finalizing uh, an announcement on hold harmless. Um, uh, I, I, I hesitate to give a, a confirmed um, prediction of when it uh, when the final decision will be made public, but we're we're real close. And what I would say is that um, the uh, as I've said actually since um, early January when the funding picture became at least far clearer to me. Um, I have very few concerns for, uh, for us in public education from a finance perspective. Um, the, uh, the resources do exist to help support school districts in the repairs, the plumbing and, and other uh, building damage remediation that's gonna be pretty extensive coming out of the storm um, and to continue to uh, support districts for all the work that they have done and then will continue to do um, for um, uh, as a as a COVID response, so uh, um, uh, while I can't give you a, a kind of a, a firm comfort and, and structure answer today, but it's it's coming. It's coming very soon. That's great news. Um, I, we don't have a lot of time left, and I uh, would like to ask Dr. Stone if you would like to close us out. Sure. <clears throat> so um, I always. Like uh, Commissioner Morath, love to be in any meeting um, with great people like him. And uh, I just want to say, um, from my position and from the school district, um, if there's any doubt that we have a responsive, um, caring commissioner, then this last year has really proven it. I mean, um, y'all, um, Commissioner Morath, from the very beginning in March, when we had to shutter our schools. He was on a daily call with us for an extended period of time. And then it went to weekly or for, for me, and I know like probably everyone else um, as needed. If, if I needed him, he takes my phone call, gets right back. I mean, within, within minutes. Um, I speak, I think for, for all of us, um, just it, having him as the leader was great. not only providing us great confidence and guidance, but uh, tons and tons of reassurance with every, in every single way. And so you know, I just wanna, you know, we, we, I'm glad Kim that you, you bestowed some appreciation in, in that direction because um, I think that, you know, he takes a lot of heat for a lot of decisions, but in the end, I know in my heart, he is making them for the good of the kids in the same way that I am, the same way that Sarah Lonser who's joined us, she's on the call as well. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, that's what we want from everyone is just to know that in their heart, they're doing what they think is right. And I can honestly believe is tell you that I honestly believe that about our commissioner. So I just want to extend that appreciation from uh, all of the educators uh, and definitely from Richardson ISD. And um, Sarah, you may want to share something. I saw that you joined us as well. Now, I apologize. We were in conflicting meetings, but I, I chime in on what Jeannie said and for the commissioner. Uh, it's good to see you. We see you. Uh, we see you a lot. And <laughs> I don't know if people know, but I mean, it is very reassuring to know that when we have questions or, you know, we have we have a lot of conversations going on about how to best serve kids. And, and we know that you're right in the middle of the conversations with us uh, every step of the way. And it is very much appreciated all the time. And, uh, you know, I think somebody said it feels like we lived another year this last week. Uh, and so we're, we're living in like cat years, you know, many, many in one in one year. And, and so and in every step that happens, uh, the commissioner is walking, walking with us. And well, I'm uh, I mean, again, I'm grateful uh, uh, for these leaders uh, and it's a, and it's an honor to, to be able to serve them. There's there's been. It's been a terrible year for everyone, um, uh, and uh, you've you've got you got two superintendents on here that have made a bunch of very difficult decisions, um, in in times when there was no right answer, um, uh, and um, are are uh, trying to do everything they can to do right by kids, and and you know now we actually have some benefit of hindsight associated with COVID. Uh, back in July and August. Uh, we didn't actually know how safe our mitigation practices were going to be, how the virus is going to work in schools. We do now. Um, we have extraordinarily levels, levels of confidence that um, school is safe. Fauci notes that uh, kids are actually safer in schools than they are in community in the community writ large um, uh, for, from the virus. And we've um, the protocols have taken steps to make it very, very safe to, to reduce the likelihood that the virus would spread 
um, inside school, whether we're talking adults or students. Um, that, not to say that it's without risk, it's still a pandemic. Um, there's still risk there, but um, our schools have, have proven to be remarkably safe and our you know, districts have taken a lot of steps to make sure that families have access to their school building. Um, and you know, I was actually just on the phone yesterday with some, a colleague from California, just to put in perspective, you know, the, the difficulty of decision-making and then the impact uh, of decision-making. In Texas, we have about 56% of our kids who are currently learning on campus in the state of Texas, but everyone is eligible to do so. Uh, in California, only 15% of kids are learning on campus today. Um, uh, and so the, the degree uh, of difficulty that we will have um, to help make up for lost time is in some places um, far more significant. I do, I do have one more question and you may have addressed this earlier, but there it came through to somebody I think who was new and that is from Jerry Chambers. Jerry, do you wanna ask your question? I can't, we can't hear you. Yeah, you, uh, it's weird, you're not on mute, but we can't, unfortunately can't hear you. Okay, Try Again, I'll ask for you. She said, if, ask if there were any hopes of a vaccination for all teachers. Uh, so I'm actually not part of that decision-making process. There's a, a, a committee that the governor has established, EVAB, I think. Um, it's got a, a bunch of health experts and sort of state policy leaders. Um, uh, they have uh, uh, identified in, in where we currently are, which is phase 1B, um, essentially a health-based protocol, which is, not, which is to say no professions uh, are identified in it. So not firefighters, not, no one by profession is in, but anybody by risk is in. So this includes anybody over the age of 65 and anybody with um, uh, um, a, um, a, a significant risk factor associated with COVID. So that actually does include a lot of educators, a lot, a lot of people that work in our school buildings, but uh, not necessarily all of them and not by a function of their profession. So that's the, 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 the current um, uh, uh, decision that uh, has been made. Um, uh, I think uh, there's some optimism that vaccine production levels are rising from the manufacturers. Um, uh, so I'm hopeful to see acceleration and, and I actually don't know who would be in the group two either. So, um, uh, but uh, certainly those who have health risks are covered in the, in the, current, in the current phase. Okay, good. Well, I know we're hoping that teachers can somehow get identified and move to the top. Bill, you want to close us out? Sure. So, you know, sometimes we have to find humor in, um, in misery. And so, Commissioner, uh, yes, the, the pandemic uh, created hell for 2020. Uh, 2021 was the year that hell froze over. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, I think uh, one, of my, one of my team members called it Snowvid 21. So Snowvid, there you yeah. go. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you again for uh, being with us. Thanks for all your leadership and uh, just know you've got a lot of great support out here in uh, uh, the Metroplex and amongst uh, all the educators, plus the business community. Uh, greatly appreciate uh, your leadership and what you're doing. So just a reminder, everybody, uh, tomorrow we start off with uh, State Representative Jim Murphy, the chair of the House Higher Education Committee at uh, 9.15, 10 o'clock, uh, State Representative Jeff Leach at um, 1030, the state controller, Glenn Hager. And then we're gonna join the Texas Tribune for an interview with the new chair of the State House Public, uh, the House Public Education Committee, Harold Dutton from uh, Houston. And that'll be pretty interesting. I'm, I'm really curious to see what kind of priorities uh, uh, Representative Dutton has vis-a-vis uh, you know, -vis, you know uh, the leader that we knew so well, uh, Mr. Huberty. And uh, so that's at 10 o'clock tomorrow. And as I said earlier, we're still uh, hoping that we can um, get uh, Speaker Phelan and a few other people put on the uh, schedule. And then um, uh, Dr. Stone, we're looking forward to seeing you on March the 8th to brief our public policy committee on the proposed uh, $750 million bond program. And I know that you're gonna give kind of a update to my board uh, later in March, uh, kind of a state of the district, if you will, abbreviate it, and we'll talk about the uh, bond again. So anyway, um, Sarah, it's great to see you. Um, uh, just know that you know, uh, you've got some great uh, graduates that are uh, doing well, that all went through PISD. As you know, I live in that portion of Richardson, um, but they would be great graduates if they were in RISD too. So thanks you all. Have a great uh, afternoon. We're adjourned. All right, thanks, Bill. Thank you.